Today we're going to be looking at inverse functions, and this is kind of an extension of what we looked at with composite functions last lesson. So you may have noticed that a couple of the composites that we did, we got x out for both of our solutions. So you're going to start seeing today why that happens. So when we have an inverse, again, we have our notation of f with an exponent, or it looks like an exponent of negative one. And so every time you see that, you are dealing with the inverse of the function with that same name. When we're looking at inverse functions, if the point AB occurs in our function f of x, then in our inverse, it's going to have those same values, but they're going to occur as a point BA. And so if you look at what I did, all I did was flip my orders. So in fact, when you have an inverse function, the domain of your original function becomes the range of your inverse and the range of the inverse or the original becomes the domain of the new inverse function. So domain becomes range and range becomes domain. Now this is gonna be important when we get to our second example. So keep that in the back of your brain that domain and range are gonna to have to make an even swap. So let's first look at how we could algebraically figure out this inverse. So example one, our function is f of x equals 3x plus 6. And so to find the inverse, our rules are, or our steps are, we are going to substitute y in for f of x if we don't already have the function written that way. Then we're going to flip flop every x and y. So that's basically flip flopping our domain and our range. Then we solve for the y to get our new equation for our inverse. So in example one, f of x, aka y equals 3x plus 6. So first I have to swap my x's and my y's. So x equals 3y plus 6. I've swapped my domain and my range, and now I solve for y. So subtract a 6, so x minus 6 equals 3y. Divide both sides by 3, so x minus 6 divided by 3 equals y. And I'm actually going to separate that out into two expressions, and you're going to see why in a sec. So really, I'm dividing both terms by 3, so x over 3 and negative 6 over 3. Or I could rewrite that as my inverse function of x is 1 third x minus 2. Alrighty, my original function, let me go back to my original color, f of x equals 3x plus 6. So let's see what happens when we graph this. So our original function f of x, 3x plus 6, means we have an x-intercept of 6, and we have a slope of 3. We're just graphing a line. I can't go up 3 over 1, so I'm going to go down 3 backwards 1, down 3 backwards 1, down 3 backwards 1. Alrighty. So just thinking about the points that I graphed, again, some of my points, we had the point 0, 6, we had the point negative 1, 3, we had the point, let's see, negative 2, 0, and we could write out more points, but I just want to look at some of these in particular. So now let's graph our inverse. So our inverse function is 1 third x minus 2. So again, let's graph the line. So we have minus 2 is our y-intercept. We have a slope of 1 third. So rise 1, run 3. Rise 1, run 3. Fall 1, backwards 3. Actually end up going to the same point. Good reason for me not to include that in my listing. So let's think about this. So for our f of, or f inverse of x, Three of my points were, let's see, I had the point 0, negative 2, I had the point 3, negative 1, and I had the point 6, 0. Compare that to the points that are listed for our function f of x. What happened? Huh. They are completely reversed. And actually, these lines look like they're very closely related. If I was to draw the line y equals x, which goes right smack through the middle of the axes, perfectly catty corner, y equals x. And just to label, there's our f of x. And that was our inverse of x. 
um, what does it look like my green line is actually doing to my picture? Yeah, it's perfectly splitting it in half. If you think back to geometry, if you were able to get there last year or previous classes where you studied any reflections, when you reflect something over the line y equals x, you just flip flop your coordinates for one another and it gets you a picture just like that. So technically what we're doing today is almost analytic geometry, yay, bridging subjects. Okay, we're actually gonna come back and do problem number two last. Let's move on to problem number three. Alrighty, problem three, f of x, aka y, equals x cubed minus two. So flip flap your x's and your y's. So x equals y cubed minus two. Add your two. And to get the cube, to get rid of that, what do we need to do to both sides? Now yep, we need to take the cube root of both sides. So that gives me cube root of x plus 2 equals y, aka f inverse of x is the cube root of x plus 2. And I flip flopped my colors, but that's OK. My original function f of x was x cubed minus 2. So again, let's graph both of these. Whenever we have an x cubed graph, again, our basic shape was we kind of start at the middle, go up to the right, down to the left. But that minus two, what is it going to do overall to our picture? Yep, just shift everything down two units. And so here's our original picture of our f of x. And again, the three points that I chose to graph, we have a point at negative one, negative three, a point at zero, negative two, and a point at one negative one. So this inverse function, the cube root, if you don't remember what that function is, let's use our mathematics to help us out. If we're supposed to be flip flopping our domain and our range, well, let's write it that way. So looking at our points, my first point, negative one, negative three would become negative three, negative one. Second point would become negative two, zero. Third point would become negative one, one. So let's graph those out and see what kind of picture that can give us. So we have negative three, negative one. We have negative two, zero. And we have negative one, one. Looks pretty darn similar to the last graph. And if you think back to our very first unit, we did actually talk about cube root very briefly. It kind of almost looks like a square root function, but instead of just going off to one direction, it goes in both directions. So it goes like this. And again, if you don't believe me, throw it into Desmos, graph it out and see what the picture looks like. But again, using that trick of flip flopping your x's and y's can absolutely help you out. Let's graph in our line y equals x just to verify. And indeed, we have a perfect reflection. So you might be asking me, well, why did I skip problem number two? Here's why. Let's go back and look at that one. So originally, we said that to find the inverse, you're flip flopping your domain and your range. So number two, we have a square root function. I'm actually going to go ahead. Let's graph this before we do anything else. So square root of x minus 4 means the minus 4 tells us go right four units. And then our square root graph goes up and over, but only in one direction. Again, I have to go a little bit off the graph, but we still get a good picture. So is every single value a domain of this function? Darn it, we have restrictions on our square root graphs because we can't take the square root of a negative number and get a real number answer. So we need to keep that in mind when we graph this inverse. So let's look at both of these things. Let's look at the algebraic version and let's look at just using those coordinates and see how we can kind of make those match up and make that work. So our original function, just to write out the points that we used, were 4, 0, 5, 1, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 2. So we should be able to graph those two, those three points and make our inverse function. But algebraically, let's see what happens. So 
we would need to flip flop our x and our y. Again, this is assumed as a y for the f of x. So really, we have x equals square root of y minus 4. Now, to get at that y, though, what are we going to have to do to the square root? Yeah, we got to square both sides of the equation. And here's where we need to start being careful. So we have an x squared equals y minus 4. Add the 4 to both sides, so x squared minus 4 equals y. In other words, our f inverse of x is x squared minus 4. And that means I have a parabola. And a parabola does not look like our f of x graph that we already drew over here. So parabola is going to look like we're going down four units. Excuse me. What should I have done with my four? Ah, my second step, I had y minus four. I need to actually add four to both sides. So add four to both sides. So my parabola has to go up four units. And usually, I would do over one, up one, over two, up four. And I would mirror that on the other side. But that means I'm going into values that are not in the domain of my x squared function. So that means just like on my original function, where my domain, I can't use anything below positive 4. So in other words, x has to be greater than or equal to positive 4. We need to think about that restriction on our inverse function. And that is why we only want to use the right hand side of that function. We cannot use any of the values that go to the left because of that restriction. So the way that restriction ends up happening because we're flipping everything around is our domain has to be greater than or equal to zero. And that's the same thing, that same test that we actually used when we were graphing rational functions before. We set our radicand that x minus 4 greater than or equal to 0 to figure out what our restricted domain would be. So keep that in the back of your brain. Again, your graph can help you verify it and remind you that, hey, if I'm going to have everything match up, if my pictures are going to line up, then I have to only use half of that parabola. OK, so this made it work perfectly with our line y equals x. So that is a way that you could check, too. If you just were looking at graphs, that would be a great test with whether or not your functions are inverses of each other. So down at the bottom, if two functions are inverses of each other, then the graph of one function is a reflection over the line y equals x of the other function. OK. Let's explore this a little bit more. Let's keep going. Next example, 4 and 5, we're going to determine whether or not the following functions are inverses of each other. We can do this using compositions like we did last class. So I'm going to have you pause the video, practice your compositions, and then come back, check to see how you did, and we'll verify your solutions. Alrighty. so to test this out again, you want to do a composition of f of g and a composition of g of f, and check to see what comes out of those compositions. So in our first one, again, f of g of x, we would plug in our g function into our f. So we would be plugging 5x minus 2 in, and then we would reverse that order. And this is what happens. Let me move this over. There we go. So. What happens is, in one direction, we get x plus 8 fifths. And again, you can just plug that in the calculator, even check your decimal. Um, then the other direction, we have x minus 8 fifths. We do not get the same value out. So this means that, unfortunately, these are not inverses of each other. But check out what happens with our second function. So again, f of x equals 1 third x minus 7. g of x equals 3x plus 21. So and these are the orders that you're going to want to do this in. So if you didn't have a chance to check that, 
here is what it ends up looking like. So in both directions, when you find the composition of functions, both of these come out as x. So that means that these indeed are inverses of each other. So if you do the compositions from last class, look for an x coming out, but you do need to test both directions for it. OK, so last piece, again, going back to the graphs for a little bit. So in a function, don't forget, your functions will always pass the vertical line test. And again, the reason this is is because we can never have the same x value calculating two different y values. We can never have a repeat of the x's. So think about parabolas. So I have two different x values that can both give me different y values, but I can't reverse it. I can't have two totally separate y values coming out of a single x. So if you try to think about kind of that sideways parabola, that's when we have problems with, hey, it doesn't pass the vertical line test anymore. So in a function, biggest thing to remember is no repeats of x's. And you can always test that with the vertical line test. So we can think of that with our next two examples. So again, we thought about this a little bit with the x squared versus the square root. So f of x, again, in number six, square root of x minus two. So minus two means move to the right two and draw in our square root. And so if we're just graphing the inverse, well, then that's pretty straightforward. Flip flop your x and y values. So let's see here, let's list them out. So f of x, I had two, zero, I had three, one, and I had 6, 2. So to do my inverse, so f inverse of x, flip flop those. So I'm going to have 0, 2, 1, 3, 2, 6. So 0, 2, 1, 3, 2, 6. So f inverse of x, and my red was my f of x. No problems when we're thinking about the points, but let's think about number seven now. So original function, and again, I know I flip flopped, so my original function is going to be red. So f of x. And again, when I graph a parabola, it starts 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 4, and mirrors it on the other side. So definitely a function, no repeats and x's. But if I look at my points, again, I have actually five points on this one. So we have a negative 2, 4, we had negative 1, 1. We have 0, 0, 1, 1, and 2, 4. If we look at f inverse, uh, if we just use the rules that we just have to flip flop the x and the y coordinates, we have a problem. So everything's going well so far, 0, 0, and then I get to the 1, 1. And I have a repeat in my x's. And with the next point, problem's going to happen the same thing. For 2, I have another repeat in my axis. And so if I graph this out, unfortunately, doing the inverse this way does not yield a function. So we'd have the same kinds of points, not a function because it doesn't pass the vertical line test. So f inverse of x, not actually a function because we didn't take into account that restriction of the domain, which our algebra would have shown us. So how can we predict this? Well, if we know what the picture of the original function looks like, we can actually do something called a horizontal line test. And this actually tests whether or not our function is one to one. And that basically means we don't have any repeats in the x's and we don't have any repeats in the y's. So, this is the horizontal line test. And technically, we are testing, is this 1, 2, 1? No x or y repeats. So let's look at our last set of examples. So number eight, 
x cubed plus 3x squared. And I'm going to go ahead and sketch this out. Going back to our polynomial functions to get a good idea of what this will look like, I need to factor it out. So actually, I'm going to put this over here. I have an x squared in common, and that leaves me with an x plus 3. So if I sketch this out, I'm going to have an x-intercept is 0 and another x-intercept at negative 3. It's going to go straight through the negative 3 because it's a single root. And then it bounces at the 0 because of the squared. So darn, this does not pass the horizontal line test because if I draw a horizontal line here, it hits more than one time. So is this one to one? Nope. Second function, OK, x squared minus x plus 1. What is the picture of this going to look like? Well, automatically in x squared, I know this is going to look something like a parabola. I don't even need to get an exact graph on this. Automatically, I know this is not going to pass the 1 to 1 function. Horizontal line test through that parabola will hit it twice. All righty, number 10. Most recent functions, rational functions. So 1 over x is just our basic straight parent function. But we have a plus 2 on the ends, which means we're just going to shift it up two units. So our graph will have a horizontal asymptote pushed up a little bit. But then we have our two branches. So if I try to draw a horizontal line anywhere on this graph, will it touch more than once? Again, take your pencil. You could actually hold it up to the screen. and at no point will you hit the graph more than one time. So this is, yes, it's a one-to-one -one function. How about number 11? Again, I need a little bit more info to sketch this out. So if I factor this out, I actually get 2x in common, leaves me with an x squared minus 2. Now, the x squared minus 2 doesn't factor very nicely, but I'm going to do kind of a more advanced factoring piece. Again, I don't expect you to be able to do this. But if you were to graph this on Desmos, you can still perform the same test. And so I know that 2 is not a perfect square. But I'm going to force it to do the difference of squares pattern by saying x plus the square root of 2 and x minus the square root of 2. And I don't know exactly what those values are, but I know that one's positive, one's negative. And I'm going to have another x-intercept at 0 because of that 2x. So we're going to have something that looks like this. I know the overall shape because it's an x cubed. And wait a second, it's the same picture as number 8. Unfortunately, does not pass the vertical line test. But what about number 12? So number 12 is x to the fifth. So generally, an x to the fifth function, just like an x cubed function, just like an x to the seventh function, is going to look overall the same. And because we don't have any extra factors other than that 1 half, and the 1 half just says it's going to be a little bit compressed towards the x-axis, but it's not going to create any dips. And again, if you're unsure of this, check it on Desmos. But your graph overall is just going to look kind of like this. And so I can put a vertical, excuse me, a horizontal line across. It will only hit in one place. So this one, yes, it is one to one. It passes that test. All right, there's a few extra practice problems on the last page of these notes. Feel free to go through and um, try those out on your own and then pull up your completed notes version to check to see how you did. Let me know if you have any questions. Um, you actually only have a graded quizzes today. It is going to go in as 20 points, but you are going to be graded on accuracy. So try it as many times as you need to to maximize your score, but do ask for help if you get stuck on anything. Talk to you later.